the message today is that a soldier never knows his strength until he meets his foe. And strength is always measured by the exercise of thought. The moment you forget to think is the moment is to cost you your life. If you don't put thought in everything that you do, every decision that you make, you're going to end up making a bad decision. That's something that I always say, go inside of a person and say, some kept telling me not to do it. Like the devil on one side and the angel on the other. What it is, is your consciousness telling you that it's always best to be thought of as a fool than for one to open his mouth and to remove all doubts. Stay positive, stay focused, and most of all, stay sucker free. Because the life you save may be your own. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share the video, and make sure you leave a comment. Bringing this guy back, this brother Flint, you guys know his story, he did a bunch of time, man. You know, he had, you know, some murder stuff in his background, you know, he's facing life sentence, but you know what, he's free now after serving, I think, almost 30 years or a little more than 30 but we're going to bring him back for a part two. Flint, what's up, man? How you feeling today? Oh, I'm fine, partly cloudy, mostly fair, though, bro, Chad. You know, I'm in a good place mentally, spiritually, and pretty much physically. But uh, everything is fine with me now. You know, uh, focus, trying to stay focused and trying to stay free. And most of all, my motto is sucker free, you know. No doubt. That's sucker free. I want that to resonate with people, man. Stay sucker free right in the land of lollipops. But anyway, <laughs> I want to uh, I want to talk a little bit more about you and, and some of the stuff that we didn't get to last time. Right. Like the BGF stuff. We could talk about that. We'll talk about solitary confinement today. We'll talk about your book. I know you got a book that you put together, man. What's the title of that book? Two steps from the blues from the pits of hell to living life again. You, you it's a book of memoir. Yeah. We got it published or anything yet, but you're working on getting that done, right? Yes, I'm working on getting that. I'm in the process of doing that now. Getting it typed up and uh edited and stuff like that. And uh trying to get it out there at least by the summer, late summer. Once you get it once you get it together, man, we'll definitely promote that book on on our page. Tell the people a little bit about the book. Well, the book is a book about my journey. And transformation from, uh, you know, living a life coming up uh, in the early age of crime, uh, heroin use. I was uh, addicted to heroin at the age of 13. And uh, I stopped. I didn't stop until I was 33 years old. Uh, it's about my, uh, you know, coming up basically alone. When my mother passed for me. She died when I was 16. And I was uh, I was doing time then, six months sentence. And the high life, uh, I pretty much was a, a man before I should have been. I pretty much experienced things that I shouldn't have had experienced at such a young age. And uh, a life of crime and a, and a life of, uh, and the reason I named the two steps from the blues was because it seemed like the closer I got, I felt like I was getting to success or uh, doing something positive. I was on the two steps from the blues because soon I slipped, I was back in it. But not in it to where it was a death sentence, but in it to, to where it was always some sort of blues. It was something sad. It was the joyous moments didn't last for long. And a lot of it had to do with... Uh, me uh coming up in the inner city in the south and uh when i was coming up uh you know the black panther party was strong in my neighborhood and uh i had ties with the panthers uh larry little who eventually became the alderman of, of, of where i was from we had the free lunch program we had the free sickle cell program 
we had free Amaland service and, you know, free breakfast and all these things took place before school. And uh, watching that just go away was a, was a struggle for me because that was more like family. And that was more like family and closest thing I had to a family because I was the only child. And like I said, I didn't know my father at all. Never seen a picture of him or nothing. And it was just me and my mom's and watching her struggle and things like that and trying to take care of her, trying to be a man, a man child. It was just a struggle. So the book is about that part of my life, part of my prison life, and all the way up to where I am now, how I got to that point that I didn't only grow old in prison, but I grew up. You know, and that was the biggest part of my transition. But you know, that's so, a, that's a that's a big thing for you to say. You know what I mean? You didn't you, you didn't grow up in prison, um, but you grew up mentally and emotionally. And I want people to understand what that means. You didn't just grow old in prison; you grew up mentally and emotionally, exactly. and, and you turned your life around. You know what I mean? Um, exactly. You know, we talked before about you. You know, you ended up stabbing the cop in prison. You know, you had you know two murder cases. Um, where people had tried to rob you, you know, that's part of the streets, you know, when you're out there getting money, doing things like that, people, they want to take what you got, what you're working for, right? Even though you were working in the wrong way and you end up in prison, man. And I want to talk a little bit about the BGF, right? The black gorilla family. You see, there's a lot of brothers that tune in like, yo, that's my man, Flint, yo, Flint. So once upon a time, man, you weren't always a nice guy in prison, were you? No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't always nice at all. But... I guess you could say it depends on how you look at it, but Chad, because there has been time to where I could see you, not knowing you from a can of paint, being confronted by two or three COs. I could be walking down the range or down the hallway or whatever. And I would immediately jump in it, you know? And uh, just because I knew your struggle was the same as mine, I might, we might not share the same views, the same ideologies, but we had the same common enemy. And uh, a lot of times that got me in trouble, you know. And uh, that's just the person I've always been. Something was embedded in me at birth, I guess, to to always help the, those that needed it, I guess you could say, at a time. You know, well, you know that's the way it used to yeah. be back in the day in prison. Like, brothers would stick together, you know, like... I was in, you know, I was in state prison before federal prison. I was young, man. I was 17, 18 years old. And I remember when, you know, the Muslims ended up setting it on the police in Comstock. And they're like, yo, mm. man, that was your common enemy back then. Unfortunately, man, yeah. things have changed now. And I'm not saying, hey, I hate all the cops because they're bad because I really don't feel that way. But I hate Me cops either. that go out of their way to do bad shit to us for no other reason but to make us miserable. So, you know, that's exactly. the way it used to be where brothers would be like, yo, what's up, man? They would get involved right away. But things have drastically changed, haven't they, brother? Yes, it has. It has changed. Or, well, really, Chad, I never, I, I remember I heard you speak on the independent car. I never heard of that car at, at that, you know, at my, at, during my journey, right? But I had uh, heard of the other cars, and I was like, wow, things have changed because, oh, there was a time when if a CO had a problem, and I had a problem with a CO, it, it was always said like this, where the CO might say, well, I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't jump you. I didn't hit you or anything like that. But I, I, my, my, my thought is, but you didn't stop the other ones from doing it. So you just big as a part of it as anything else. But when I was introduced, like I said, I was on revolutionary time without even knowing it. And then when I became conscious of it, I was like, wow. I was reading the Saul Dad Brothers, and George Jackson became his spirit, you know, became, uh, I mean, it, it was, we intertwined spiritually without even me knowing them physically, you know, and uh, I took on that out of the ideology, and uh, remember last interview, I spoke with Sweet Mac, you know, and uh, when we bonded, he was at Long Park, and uh, he was a he was a lieutenant. He was a high-ranking member of the BGF, and uh, it was the BGF that 
you know, basically uh, almost cost him his life, a friend, you know. So my views all along, sometimes it'd be the closest person to you that do you the most harm, man. Sometimes and in learning that, sometimes it is that I said, that you're close to. It is most of the time, but I have been on missions, you know, that didn't nobody even know that, they, that it was a mission until it was done. Let's you talk know. a little bit about that and, and about the BGF. What position did you hold in the BGF? Well, I was a general in Atlanta. You you know, general I was a general at Venezville. Yeah, I was a general at Venezville. I was a general at Edgefield. Uh, until uh, I decided to uh, step back, and that was a dangerous moment for me. We're, we're going to get there in a second. When you were in Atlanta, right, with the BGF, were the ABs there at the time? Yeah, it was some ABs there, and it was some, um, it was some, uh, dirty white boys there. I I didn't know much about the Nazi lowriders. Maybe they was under the radar at the time, but it was some uh, BGFs. I mean, it was some uh, ABs there, some uh, MS-13, and some uh, Black Hands. They was there too. The BGF respected in Atlanta back then. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was a mutual respect. It was a mutual respect. And the kind of respect to where uh, everything, you had to work things out then. It wasn't no walking around about it for years, not not sure about whether or not uh, things are worked out. Uh, there's a disagreement or, or some level of disrespect uh, it was always dealt with at the moment. You know, if it's over, if it was over, it was over. If it wasn't, it was on. You Talk know? about, yeah, you say it was on. Was there any violent clashes between the BGF and other cars, other groups? Uh, no, we had we had close ties with uh, the Diamonds, you know, and uh, some Crips, but it was never... Uh, no clashes. And when you was talking about the uh, the murder that jumped that, that happened with the Chinese guy, I think what happened that day was the, the region or uh, somebody from uh from uh Washington was there that day. You know how they, they have everything laid out all beautiful and everything for the region and all this. That's when that murder took place when they was there. And there was a lady there that was high-ranking uh, official in Washington. Her feet never touched the ground. They got her up out of there. I remember it clearly now. I thought about it. I said, yeah, that happened when the reason was there. It was like uh, a display. It was like, we're going to do this at the biggest time, at the biggest moment, when the biggest people are here. And this going to be a, a legendary event. Remember John Powers? Do you remember that dude? Yeah. He's coming to me. It came to me slowly, yeah. It came to me slowly. I remember the Chinese and everything, yeah. Yeah, he was a big boy. had plenty of money. So the Chinese, had a lot going on. he was over there getting money, right? Gambling, doing all mm -hmm. that stuff. And these dudes were plotting on him, wanted what he had, and decided, hey, we're going to take it. And if we got to kill him, we're going to kill him. Yeah. And that's what happened. That's and I know what you happened. talked about. I know you talked briefly about, man, going on missions. What type of things did you have to do in prison, man? I want people to know. Well, a couple of times, uh, Tad, uh, without putting too much on it, you had to, I had a, you was talking about cellists. And uh, I remember I came out the hole. I was in the hole for a dirty one. I had came out the hole. And there was a little white kid that was in my cell named Heath. He was out of uh, Louisiana, I think it was. Had a life sentence. And uh, he didn't weigh 120 pounds soaking wet. And uh, he had just got that rid of And he was clean. And I said, well, listen, uh, I don't know I don't, I, I don't know what's going on with you, uh, things of this nature. I said, but you're a kid, man. You're about 20 years old, I saw him. He was 22. And... Uh, I said, well, what you gonna what you gonna do on this bed? You got life. And uh he wasn't sure. 
I said, well, you're going to have to make a decision. I said, no, I was, I, he, he had came out the hole. I was already in the cell. When he came, I said, you got to make a decision. I said, by the time the door busts out the count, you're going to have to make a decision on whether or not who you go going to roll with, who you're going to be with, or how you're going to do your time. I said, because it's going to come at you. It's going to come at you from all different kind of angles. I said, the ABs going to come at you, the, the, the dirty white boys, the Ku Klux Klan, whoever it is, will try to, you know, pick you off. <laughs> I say, so you got to make a decision. And uh, he said, man, I grew up, you know, around blacks and all kind of people. You know, he said, I'm not into that. I said, uh, well, what you into? And he said, I'm into doing this life sentence and trying to get back in court. He said, I ain't a coward. I said, all right, well, I see you out the yard clothes. So he came back out the yard clothes and uh, guys that came to me and say, yo, uh, Flint, you know you got that uh that uh white boy in your cell, man. Uh, what he gonna do? He gonna move? He gonna find him a cell or what? I said, well, I ain't rushing him to move. If he find him, a, if he want to go to another cell, that's on him. I said, but I ain't, you know, putting him out. I said, the kid got life service, man, for carjacking. I said, so uh, you know, yeah, I'm gonna leave that decision up to him. And so after about a week or so, you know. He found us, he said, man, uh, you a good seller, man. I said, what you trying to stay? He said, yeah. I said, well, you know, it might be a problem. I said, how, how far you willing to go? I said, now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to cross the line on this one. Because I was your age one time, you know. I said, I'm going to cross the line on this one. I said, now, if you don't cross it with me, I'm going to take you out. And uh, we went out on the yard. And I went to uh, D.C. And uh, there were some boys out of the South from his hometown that was kind of like doing their own thing and everything. And I told him, I said, well, this is my set. That, you know, people had already knew he was my set. And uh, uh, things kind of got a little heated. They wanted him off the yard and all that. So, uh, I went and uh, put some work in for him. And uh, after that, where I got around, that that was my seller, and he was a good dude. He was solid, you know, and that uh, I dreamed with Doug to do, you know, because I knew what his struggle was going to be, you know. Were the, blacks, and, uh, were the blacks accepting of you saying, hey, man, I'm going to keep this white dude as my celly? Yeah, some was, because they knew me. But a lot of them wasn't. You know, a lot of them, uh, there's few of them had some problems with it until they got to know him, you know. And when you say, let and, me ask uh, you this, when you say you had to put in some work, can you talk a little bit about what you had to do, who it was with? Yeah, dude, it was, uh, it was a uh, black dude out of Alabama and uh, a white dude out of, uh, I think he was from, uh, well, he was from Georgia. You know, and uh, they were trying to uh, press him about uh, his income, you know, because his mom and them, they were looking out for him because he had just failed with life sentence. And they were trying to get him to bring some work in on visit, whether or not he was getting visits and stuff like that. And uh, I had uh, I had told him, uh, look, man, dude just came in. He trying to get in the law library. You know, I know you know he might sell it. And uh, they were trying to figure out who was standing with me, you know? But at that time, like I said, when I came from the state, I felt like I was doomed anyway. So my mission was a whole duck. I had took my, my frame of mind to a whole different kind of level. And uh, I didn't care what happened, how it happened, when it happened, you know? And uh, he kept pressing him and kept pressing him. So uh, I caught him down there on the way pile and put that, put that, uh, that curl ball thing upside his head, you know, upside his body, you know, you know. So after a while, Atlanta was kind of like changing a little, and it was, it was, they was, uh, I think, uh, they was clearing it out somewhat. People were even going to Coleman one or Coleman two. They was cleaning, they was cleaning out a little bit at the time, you know. Well, uh, it pretty much got to the point to where. When they seen him, they seen me. When they seen me, they seen him. You know, and it wasn't no uh, 
it wasn't no soul shit with him. It was just some, it was just a statement that, you know, you know, white and black and Hispanics alike, I think to some degree they kind of respected the fact that, hey, dude just, dude just solid, man. You know, he liked this dude, dude's a little fella. He's a, he had plenty of heart and he was rolling with me the same way I was rolling with him. And they kind of like, yo, that's General Sally right there. He good, he solid. And, you know, and just kind of like just blew over a little bit. The BGF, but, uh, the BGF dudes didn't have a problem with you having a white Sally? Now, nah, after a while, uh, eventually, uh, he found it. It was a home of his came. And uh, I said, that, you know, it would be best that, you know, you and him go ahead and, you know, sell up, man, because uh, one of us going to end up getting killed or uh, getting the death sentence. You know what I'm saying? And uh, he was with it. So uh, we remained solid. We remained friends. And, you know, he knew that uh, I was there for him. If, if he needed me to be, you know, whoever was with me, they was there with me, you know. So let's talk about something that like, people want. I want to talk about something that people want to know about Flint, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about shot callers. You were the general of the BGF, right? And sometimes in prison, you have to call shots, right? Shot caller is a person that, you know, hey, I'm, I'm the boss here. But you got bad shot callers, you got good shot callers. Sometimes you got a shot caller that makes bad calls. Sometimes you got shot callers that make good calls. You ever have to make a call, man, that you regretted? Well, I got to think about that one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it was uh, there was a kid. I don't know if I really regretted the call. Well, it was a it was, it was a kid that was a blood, and uh, he didn't want to be a blood no more. He wanted to uh, be a Muslim. And uh, I was like, wow, this. So it was brought to me. And that's that's one thing I didn't like about being the shot caller tag was that didn't nobody want to make the hard call. Didn't, didn't nobody want to make a, a justifiable, a righteous decision about anything whether it was good or whether it was bad, but it had to be just. It had to it had to fit whatever the issue was. So the bloods didn't want to let him go. And uh, I talked to the shot called of the bloods, which happened to be a, a brother out of California. I, I, I can't think of his name. It'll come to me. Big old dude, too. Uh, and me and him was cool uh, up until that point. And I was like, hey, man, I say, dude, you know, he ain't, he ain't, from, he ain't from California, nothing. The, the dude from South Carolina, man, he just got caught up in the sound effects of blood. You know, he ain't a blood at heart. I say he'll cause more damage, more harm in the long run than to just let him go. Well, uh, he going to have to pay as long as he on this pound. I said, pay what? What do you owe you? We'll pay. Just let him go. And uh, they didn't want to. And he kept coming to me. I said, well, I, you know, this far as I can go with it. That, you know, you you in it now. And they end up ruining this kid, man. I mean, beat him to, he basically forgot who his name was. And I seen him, I seen him later on, and he gave me a look like, man, you could have helped me, and you didn't. And that I feel so bad for him, man. You know, the the the, 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 the there was a part of me that felt so bad for him because I didn't want I, I knew I, I would never wanted that to be me. You know. And that's when I knew, I, I, I said, man, I'm, either I'm getting soft or I'm, or I'm growing up. And it wasn't that I was getting soft, I was growing up. And I knew that they say all this fan love and war, but it's not. You know, because you can make a decision at 20 that you won't make at 40. You know, 
times times change, people change. And uh, that was one of the hardest ones that I had to deal with was watching this kid. And after they finished punishing him, this, it was all hands on there. You know? And I'm like, wow, and I used to, I, what do you I mean used by, to watch it. What do you mean by all hands on? Tell the people. Uh, oh, shit. Any, anything they wanted to do with him, any kind of way they wanted to do with him. You know, well, fuck him or, or take his money, take his commissary and everything. You know, and to where he was, he basically became suicidal. I think he wanted somebody to just get it because he wouldn't check in or nothing. Crazy, crazy life. But you eventually end up transitioning from BGF to, you you know, you get into what, the nation? No, nah, more science. More yes, science, too. And you end up becoming the shake, too, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, first lieutenant. And I was put in that position to them more. <laughs> they had a vote one time. I, I'm coming off visit. And they find out that they done voted me to be the grand sheet. I said, Lord, here we go. And uh, that went well for me, though. You know, because uh, I was actually pulling people out of situations that I knew they didn't they didn't know what they was getting into or they was getting into it and didn't know what the outcome was come, going to be. And so uh, I got a hold to a lot of young cats when I was in the Morris Science Temple that went on ahead and, and, and to this day still functioning in a positive way, you know, and uh, I, and I grew spiritually. You know, I was like, wow, this 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 is all right. But I had one problem with the nation when I was the sheep. And uh yeah, how about I was on visit? Because you know, my wife, European, and uh and my son, and then they had came to visit me. And uh the uh second in command for the uh, nation of Islam was on visit that day. So uh, he got visit before I did, and, and, and when he got there, you know, he said, oh, man, I seen the sheik out there with a white woman. I said, no, he didn't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it wasn't even nothing to think about. I called him outside the kitchen. Uh, I said, listen, I said, uh, this prison shit and all that, it's cool with me, however, however it is. I said, but man, if you ever said a thing about my family again, or who I'm up there with, I would kill you. And you can go tell the whole nation or the nation of America. You know, and uh, you were like, no, no, I was, yeah, yeah. And I ain't, I ain't want to let it go, Chad. Because this is, this is my blood. This is my family here. Yeah. You know, now I don't know prison politics and all that shit goes out the one when it comes to my family. And uh, so uh, that was a, a big apologetic moment from the nation on that part right there because it was ignorance, you know. And uh, I knew then I, I, was, I, was, I was changing, man. And uh, different thing, my priorities had leaned towards a whole different, whole different thing and I wanted to come home. You know, so, I want uh, people to know this, Flint, that a lot of people know you in the federal prison system, man. They know you for being a man of your word, man, a, a leader, a shot caller, whatever they want to call it. But at the end of the day, man, you were a dude that was well-respected, a dude that would definitely put in that work, um, had no yeah. problem. And, you know, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but you had no problem putting that knife in someone if you had to. But like you said, you evolved, you became more mature and you became a gentleman. But this is what people forget. You can become a gentleman, but that gangster is still there. You just put him away. But he can come out if he has to come out. And a lot of people don't understand that, man. And I tell people that. Well, I used to tell people that. You know what I mean? Um, even now, I like, hey, I'm about my family too, man. Like 100. Yeah, percent And and I'm on, I'm on go time when it comes to my family, bro. Yeah, overtime. It's, it's overtime. I've been seeing a comment chat to where uh, one of my homeboys, a uh, crank, uh, uh, crank, I think he said. Uh, Oh yeah, the DC dude, they uh they they fuck with Flint hard, you know what I mean? You uh, know, 
Uh, I did. They did. And I did too because so I guess because they was coming from the state and I was coming from the state. And you know, most in the state things are physical. It seemed like when I got to the Fed, it was all psychological warfare. You know, uh, we'll have a we'll we'll sit down and cook a meal with you. As soon as you bend down in the cooler to get some ice, we're gonna stab you and kill you. You know what I mean? Uh, 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 we'll make a card for you, then turn around and, and cut your throat. I mean, everything was so shysty. And I in in me dealing with the DC uh but it was like what you see is what you got. You know, however it was, that's what it was gonna be. And I and I, I was I was I was I was able to deal with that. But what I wasn't ready for was, you know, the 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 treachery, the backstabbing. And you had said, when you, when you were reading out your book, I think the guy was Mark or somebody, it was somebody that you couldn't stand, <laughs> you know, and you, and you had to listen to this guy, but the whole time you think, this this guy's a cold idiot. That was Stevie Burke. Yeah, Stevie Burke, you didn't like him whatsoever. And I, I understood why, you know, it's, I mean, it's cold, and I've been in situations like that to to where I just bucked. I said, "Man, I'm not dealing with this idiot." Look at what he say, you know. Let me ask and, you this. And, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. But uh, what was the turning point with, with me just pulling out of everything was uh, when I had uh, got to uh, Ashland, and it was uh, a Italian guy named Dennis. Man, a good dude, good dude. Made sure it was solid, you know. He was connected. Made sure I had everything I needed when I got there. I didn't know me from a can of paint, but uh, they had some problems with me and his me and his friendship, you know. And uh, one day I was coming in off the yard for working out. And he was going out, and he was heated. I seen it all. I said, "What's up, D?" He said, "No, I'm going going out here and I'm deal with these people." I said, well, I'm going with you. He said, no, you don't have to do that, G. He called me, G. He said, you ain't got to do that. I'm, I'm having, I said, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm, you know, well, I tell you what, I just go out there and act like I'm not out there. And uh, he, went, <laughs> and he went out there and he, you know, straightened it. And uh, everybody got together and he was like, dude, this, this is a solid dude. He's my friend. And, you know, who don't like it, just don't like it. And, uh. You know, we ended up having a spread. Me and the Italians, we had a spread, and we sit down and we ate, and everything was solid, you know? And that's the thing. I feel like being a man, you don't have to apologize for being that. You know, you don't have to apologize for standing on principles that are just, you know? You don't owe nobody any explanation when you are right. My mother always told me, she said, if you're wrong, be a man enough to admit you're wrong. But if you're right, you take it as far as it need to go. And I always held on to that, right, Chad? As far as it needs to go. <clears throat> Ain't that something? <laughs> I used to tell people that, man. Sometimes, you know, I'd have dudes be like, yo, man, this dude right here. And, 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 and Cedric Dean taught me this, right? And, and, and USP Lee. And I would tell dudes like, all right, man, you ready? We're going we're gonna to go kill this dude. You ready? That's what we're going to do. Pack your stuff, man. You ready to kill him? And they'll be like, and I'm like, nah, let's go. I'm going with you. Let's pack our shit. And then they'd be like, uh, uh. I'm like, oh, so if it ain't worth killing him over, it ain't worth beefing over. So you're That's faking. You don't really want to kill this dude, man. You're faking, man. Exactly. But there exactly. are situations where, you know, I, you know, where I felt like I was in a position, even with 40 years, once upon a time, I used to tell people, and I have told people this. I said, hey, man, you ain't willing to go as far as I'm willing to go. So you should probably be easy. You know what I mean? And, you know, when you have a position in prison, sometimes you have to, you know, you have to fear people. Sometimes you, I mean, you have to put the fear of God in people in order yeah, to get them do. to think straight, man. And I tell people, yeah, man, you, you like it here? I don't. I tell people, hey, you got a halfway house? You want me to take it? Because I don't have a halfway house. You're getting ready to go home and you're getting smart doing this bullshit? I'll take your halfway house. I'll punch you right yeah. in the face right now. And, you know, not I know tough guy shit, but that's something that you have to do sometimes in prison to get people to be like, oh, shit, man. This shit ain't that serious, yeah. man. Yeah, ain't that serious. And you call good money now. I, I've done that a couple of times. Came back from something outside or something. And um, 
I said, what's wrong with you, bro? Man, dude, just... I said, well, if he disrespect, let's go back and stuff. Let's go kill him right now. Cut his head off and everything. Throw it down the chair. Right now, let's do it. <laughs> I mean, I mean it, wasn't, it wasn't really like that, man. I, I was just saying, I, I think he should apologize. No, he shouldn't apologize. You was right, he was wrong, and the game is take him out. Let's kill him right now. Forget about your family. Forget about everything. Let's go kill him. I ain't got nothing to lose. Man, you don't lost your mind. It ain't that serious. Now it ain't that serious. Something. Now it's time to, to do something for real. It ain't that serious, right? Crazy, crazy. But, I'm, but this is a scenario right here, bro. Everybody was on Saturday morning. That will forget it. I've been around about maybe two years. The Hispanics, the whites, I mean, everybody was out there on the way out. Deal bar and everything. Even me, I, I had just came off the yard and I go in both TV rooms. Sports TV room and the other TV room. All the young blacks was in there just BT and uh, everything, dancing, rapping. I said, I see y'all in here having a good time while everybody else out there working out, getting ready for war. What y'all doing? Getting ready to go to a concert? No, what, what do you mean? I said, man, I'll get your ass out of this TV room and go out there and exercise and run a lap, walk a lap, or do something. But this shit here got to stop. And uh, it did. They went out there and they started got them a little car together, got a little workout crew together. And I went out there and started working out with some of them and, you know, showing them how to do it the right way and the wrong way, you know, stuff like that. So my thing was always on a positive move. But if, I, I would blank if if that positive was turned to a negative, you know, and uh, took it too far a lot of times. But hey, it is what it is. Look, man, is. I'm I'm gonna get ready to close the show, right? But again, man, I point. appreciate you talking on the BGF and you know your experiences in prison. But what message are you gonna give today, man? Because you always drop jewels, man. I know you got a message for somebody today. Man. Yeah, I got something for him today. The message today is that a soldier never knows his strength until he meets his foe. And strength is always measured by the exercise of thought. The moment you forget to think is the moment it's to cost you your life. If you don't put thought in everything that you do, every decision that you make, you're going to end up making a bad decision. That's something that I always say, go inside of a person and say, some kept telling me not to do it. Like the devil on one side and the angel on the other. What it is, is your consciousness telling you that it's always best to be thought of as a fool than for one to open his mouth and to remove all doubts. Stay positive, stay focused, and most of all, stay sucker free. Because the life you save may be your own. No doubt, man. I, hey, I definitely appreciate that, man. I'm going to have to rewind that thing and listen to that a couple times. Might even put that at the beginning of the clip. Listen, man, I definitely appreciate you. You know, keep pushing, keep doing everything you can do, man. I'm here, man, when you reach out. I know I'm busy sometimes, but if you need anything, man, hit me up. I appreciate you. It's always a blessing, man. I'm going to close the show. It's time. always a blessing, man. It's always a blessing to talk to you. I'm always uh, on your channel, man. I'm, and I'm always inspired by what you say, what 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 your supporters say. And uh, one thing for sure, or two things for certain, man, that forgiveness is one of man's greatest sins. I hear you. Listen, man, I appreciate you. I'm going to close the show. Blood on the Razor Wire okay. TV. If you like this video, share it, especially that message at the end. Someone needs to hear it. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. With respect, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, we're out.